You've got to be willing to open your heart. We can't say we want love and then put walls up around our heart and be afraid to give it to someone. When someone meets someone new, when is the appropriate amount of time to know that this person could be one of the people that you spend the rest of your life with, a long time with? It's very instant and immediate. So wow. here's the thing. Society has brainwashed us to believe that love and identifying it takes time. That's a lie. In most situations, when it takes months, you have not fallen in love. You've learned to tolerate them. You've grown attached wow. to them. All right? You, you, you've you got enjoyed a part of the process. It's giving exactly. you connection. You're not lonely. Exactly. And, and when you've invested months, you are more likely to not want to walk away from it because all the time and energy you put in. So now you mistake wow. your attachment to the investment as love, and it's not really love. When you sit down with people who can say they felt a real or they have a real connection with their partner, I think every story, I don't know of any one story that's opposite of this, they will all say it was pretty much instant. First date, you may not know 100% fact, I'm going to marry this person, but you knew the potential was there. You knew like this could be the one that, that at least came to mind. And so again, when, when we don't have that in that first conversation, that first day, it's unlikely. I'm not going to sit there and say it's impossible that it can happen days later or a week later or whatever. Um, but typically, and even if you can't articulate it as you knew they, were, they could be the one, when people look back, they can tell you that they felt something very strong in that initial engagement with their partner that said they knew something was different. They, they may not even know what it was, but they knew, okay, this isn't normal. This isn't like the rest. Something's going on here. And then there's a full realization of this is it. What is that something that we can't understand, that feeling? What is that called? Is that just like your, your magnets connected to each other? Is that your energy is so attracted because there's so much opposites or it's so much similarities? What is that force that gets people to say there was something different about this person when I met them? I personally believe it's your spirit recognizing its match. Because there, there, if you speak to a lot of people um, of different religious beliefs, there's the belief that things happen in the spirit before they happen in the physical. All right? So it's almost like the spirit is ahead of us, which is why the spirit knows the truth, which is why intuition, gut instinct, third eye, whatever you want to call it, it always seems to be accurate because your spirit knows before you know. So we're feeling it within our spirit. The problem is it's getting our mind in tune with the spirit. It's allowing our heart to accept what the spirit is saying to us. But we feel it. We just don't know how to always explain it. Those who are very in tune with the spirit can recognize it much quicker and, and accept it for what it is much quicker because they're very in tune already. Why is it so hard for our mind and our heart to get caught up to our gut or intuition of that initial explosion of chemistry? And also, can that explosion of connection and chemistry be harmful in a different way? Okay, so one, fear. Fear is the number one reason why we, we struggle to accept. So one of the things I explain to a lot of women, you know, and I have my membership group for them. So I, I've had this discussion where I say, listen, you know, the difference between intuition and fear is logical deduction. So when you're trying to analyze and break things down, that's your mind. All right. And fear is coming into that because you're saying, well, I shouldn't do this because of that, or this can't be this because of that. Intuition requires no logic. Your spirit requires no logic. It simply feels, it senses, it knows. That's it. You don't have to explain it. Again, gut instinct doesn't require things to logically add up. It just tells you this is it or something's wrong or this is right or whatever the case may be. So fear is the number one thing. And that fear stems from lack of healing from past relationships. We, we've been down this road of emotional investment. We've gotten hurt before. We've been wrong in our lives about wanting to believe someone could be it. Even though we know this feels different, we still have the fear of disappointment that creeps back in. How do we and let so, go of that fear and not sabotage an amazing opportunity in a relationship? You got to heal from your past. There's no way around it. 
and, and this is why I say people who have not healed, they can meet their connection right now, the most amazing partner, and it will scare them to death. And they will either run, self-sabotage, something. It's going to be a problem because they have not healed. And when you have not healed, the vulnerability that's required in connection is so unlike anything else or with anyone else that if you don't have a, a, a level of confidence and again, a foundation of healing in your life, it seems way too overwhelming and scary. So you've got to heal in order to not find yourself sabotaging, run away and, and not being able to embrace that real love. What if both parties come to something and there's this explosion of chemistry or just instant, like, wow, there's something different feeling and both have not healed their past, but they stay together, they figure it out and they're together. Is there going to be a lot of problems and trauma and stress that comes up over the years if they both haven't healed before they get into a relationship or can they heal in the relationship together? It is possible let me backtrack a little bit. First, let me say that people have to understand there is a such thing as right person, wrong time. All right. Mm -hmm. People don't want to believe that. There are a lot of people who reject that idea. They say, oh, if it's the wrong time, it's not the right person. That's not true. You can meet that individual that you have an amazing connection with, but both parties still need growth before they can come together. All right. And so now is what, ha what happens if they come together and they haven't healed? So here's the thing. It is possible to get through that and survive and have a healthy relationship. It is unlikely for most people to survive being with someone you have a connection with and you have not healed. Again, most wow. people won't even allow themselves to be with that person. They'll sabotage it so much. They'll, they'll dive in, but then they'll cheat or they'll, they won't respond to the person. They'll do something, right? Yes, and, and, and speaking of cheating, they, they tend to have a history of going back to an ex because the ex feels safer because it's not as vulnerable over there, all right? I can maintain more emotional control. It's familiar, so it's easier. So I've seen plenty of situations where, again, the connection was so overwhelming, so they ran back to their ex. No one, they're not, they're not for, the ex is not for them and they're not for their ex, but again, it just feels safer there. So yes, a lot can go wrong if you try to be together when you have not healed and you have this connection, it would be best to acknowledge, okay, you know what? We got some work we need to do. We realize we have a connection here. Let's work on ourselves in the meantime before we take that next step. Can you heal while having sex with one or multiple partners for fun on the side? <laughs> I'm not going to say it's impossible, but again, highly unlikely. Um, sex is such a distracting thing. And we, we have to understand that so much can come from our sexual interactions. There can be new drama. There can be, hell, an unwanted pregnancy. There can be a, a host of things. And all of that will derail you in the healing process. You also have to be honest with yourself. You're, you may be having the sex because you're trying to distract yourself from the healing. Like the sex is just a coping mechanism for you. Same as drugs, same as alcohol. People turn to these things because they don't want to deal with their reality in life. So right. you've got to be honest. Are you trying to just bury your head in sexual interactions? Or is it just, if it's happening in a natural flow of life, okay, then, then there's a greater chance that you can survive this. But you got to be really careful. I would suggest cutting that off yeah. if you're trying to heal. You know, again, I don't want to say it's impossible, but you're going to make it extremely difficult and highly unlikely. For sure. I want to ask you about the best ways to meet someone these days, 2020 moving forward, the do's and don'ts for online dating. But what I'm hearing you say is that you shouldn't be trying to meet someone. You shouldn't be doing the online dating game until you've fully healed or at least started the process of healing because healing is a journey. Sometimes things take a lot longer to heal fully, um, but at least acknowledging and, and starting that process what would be a process to start healing your past relationships or pains before we get into the conversation of do's and don'ts of online dating? Okay. So of course, going to a therapist or coach is the, the ideal thing to do. Um, you, you typically need that outside party that can help you process some things, help you see new perspectives and go through a process of healing. Now, I will be honest, not every coach or therapist is going to help someone heal. Sometimes it just turns into a venting session. So you've got to be real careful about 
okay, if I've been going to this therapist or coach for many weeks or months now, what progress have I really made? Have I, have I been resolving or have I been coping? Because many are teaching you how to cope and manage and, and how to function within your brokenness, but they're not resolving it and helping you heal. Now, of course, you know, I'm big on healing. So I have my book, Love After Heartbreak, which gives people the exact steps to healing. So one of the steps, I'll give you the first step, is um, getting the hurt out in front of you. So it's this who hurt me list. And so you get a piece of paper, you write down who hurt me, and you ask yourself the question, who hurt me? And now everyone who comes to mind, you put them on the paper. Doesn't matter if it happened very long ago. Doesn't matter if you think you moved past it. If they come to mind when you ask the question, then that means there's some kind of relevance there. And so now you put them on the paper in like two sentences of what they did to hurt you. This will now at least help us identify what you've been holding on to and where the hurt is and what needs to be properly addressed. And then from there, we can do the other steps of getting things off your chest and forgiveness and all these different things that's involved in healing. I love that. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of writing letters to people that you never sent them, telling them how, you, how it made you feel, what you're, what you're frustrated and angry about with them, forgiving them, letting it go. And then I like to burn the letter and bury it as well in the, gro <laughs> in the ground to hopefully create a sense of like, okay, this was alive in me and now I'm killing this and this, this feeling, this energy, and I'm, I'm putting it to bed and I'm putting it back in the world to hopefully create something new, to grow something new and more loving and powerful and create that intention. Uh, but I think that's really important. When should we know that we have, are healed enough? How do we know when our healing has gone far enough down its journey before we should get into meeting someone new, putting ourselves out there on social media, online dating apps, and things like that? All right. Well, first thing I want to say is, now, there are going to be times where sending the letter to the person is actually the best thing to do. Really? Yes. A lot of people are scared about that. And it's a very difficult hurdle to jump. But I literally got a DM today from a woman who read the book. She wrote her letter last year. It was to her mother. She didn't want to send it. She held on to it. She said she just finally built up the courage because I, I tell them in the book, 99% of the time, I'm going to tell you to send the letter. Wow. And so she finally did it. And she said they end up having the best conversation they've ever had in their life. Now they're like the best of friends. Like it's taking their relationship to a whole new level. And, and it's not, that's not the purpose of sending it, but there's so much good that can come from taking the extra step of actually sending the letter and making sure that person is aware of how you felt and, and, and what you were going through. Now, in regards to knowing when you've properly healed, number one thing is when you can embrace being fully vulnerable with somebody. All right. If vulnerability still scares you, you have not healed enough. All right. You've got to be willing to open your heart. We can't say we want love and then put walls up around our heart and be afraid to give it to someone. You're contradicting yourself. You're working against yourself. So you've got to be willing to be vulnerable. You also have to make sure any negative perceptions that you've held onto due to past experiences, you're, you've done away with them. So for example, if you have been saying all men are dogs because you've been hurt by so many men, well, you can't be out there dating and still screaming all men are dogs. That's right. not going to work in your favor. You've got to accept that good men exist, that you can receive a great man, that you deserve a great man. So when you have a more positive outlook and, and way of thinking, and listen, we're going to all have our negative thought moments. That happens. But your dominant or more consistent thought pattern is positive, hopeful and, and things of that nature, now we, you, we can say you're ready to get back out there. How important is the language or the inner thoughts, the actual physical words we use in the inner language, the inner dialogue in terms of attracting or finding the right partner? It's extremely important. You know, we, we hear it all the time. Words are power. And the reality is that the words you speak to yourself, the thoughts you have, they will, whether knowingly or unknowingly to you, they will dictate your energy, the energy that you give off to people or the, the, the way that your spirit comes across to individuals. And so you can put on a happy face, but if your thought is negative, pessimistic, all right, and dwelling in this, then your energy will still be negative. All right, what you do on the surface isn't going to be able to hide that, which is why you have some people who swear, well, I'm not a bad person. Yeah, but you're not a positive person. 
All right. You, right. you may be good people, but no, you are miserable. And, 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 it's, and it's not even just you're miserable, like you're, you're dwelling in it in your life, but you give off miserable energy. And so who's going to want to be around that? Who's going to want to commit to that? At the most, they might want to have sex with you, but they're not going to want to tie themselves to you in a committed long-term relationship or marriage. And people can feel that energy. What, I don't care if you're a man, woman, or in between. Some, you can feel the energy of someone. And if you haven't healed properly yourself, you may be attracted to a wounded individual to then try to find some validation or try to find some connection there. And that's why it's important for you to heal so that you can fully see the energy around you and see who is a potential great match for you. Because if you haven't healed, you're going to keep attracting negativity and repeating certain patterns. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. And, and if you talk to any person who has healed, they can tell you how they feel energy even more now where they become more aware. It's so much easier to see past the facades that so many people are putting up because now healing allows us to get more in tune with our spirit. And by getting more in tune with our spirit, we get more in tune with everyone's spirit because technically we are all connected through the spirit. All right. And so it's easier to be in touch with that when you get away, get rid of the blockage of trauma, past disappointments and hurts, disappointments, things of that nature. It's powerful stuff, man. I'm still trying to get to my, one of my first questions, which is what's the best way to meet someone these days in online dating? But it sounds like that's so far ahead of what you need to be thinking about first. Like, have I started to heal? Are there people who have hurt me? Are there people that I need to apologize to? You know, all these different things. It's almost like you got to do the work before you can start doing the work of finding someone. Absolutely. So I think it's important for us to remind people of this process first before we say, okay, you've done the work. You've started the process of healing. You feel like you can open your heart and be vulnerable to anyone and it's not going to hurt you and cripple you. If you want to learn more about how to master your mind, check out this next video right here. We're all faced with great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. And we are at that point, at that nexus point in our, our evolution as a species. So then you don't try to fix that. That's never going to work. What you do 